So I have a number of uh, different slides, I mean, a call order to um, look at study skills and time management and other factors that would have to do uh, to enhancing your performance. As I was uh, looking over this, uh, I thought on a clever title here today, um, <clears throat> Engineering Learning Strategies Toolkit. Well, um, you know, I'm really enamored of this idea of being a learning strategist, hey? It's the idea that you can apply techniques, that you can gain control over the study process, that you can tailor your study to the situation at hand, and that all courses you would get to treat more or less uniquely so that you can maximize your, uh, your outcome in that particular course. So, um, you know, this whole idea of being a learning strategist, something randomized, you know, really. But really, though, a sense of gaining increased control Often what happens, we have different techniques that we use coming out of high school or you know, methods that we utilize when we study or we develop procrastinative aspects uh, that interferes with our uh, effectiveness as students. So uh, trying to get at these sorts of things and figuring out what will work for us so that we can be more productive and achieve our goals and get the grades that we need I think that's, uh, you know, in any domain, it's a really important one, you know. Um, so, Cheryl, thanks a lot. Um, here's an overview here. Um, <clears throat> there's so many things, again, that, that can be discussed. So, um, you know, in the top left quadrant, you've got insufficient information. Um, that's a big issue, of course. Uh, you can imagine when you go into an exam and you feel, hey, I don't really know that I know this material. I'm not really all that sure that I can remember the material, or um, as Adrian, uh, I think, probably intimated there a moment ago, maybe you haven't solved the problems, maybe you only solved the problem half an hour before a class or something like that, you know? Uh, these sorts of things, how would, uh, you know, what would that indicate for when you have to write an exam in two or three weeks' time, perhaps, or your final exam? How accessible? would that information be to you at that critical juncture. So how you study and how you prepare in anticipation of an exam is a really critical aspect of how that will go for you, you know. So I mean, a lot of that work uh, for, for many, for, for everyone, really is done up front. Um, <clears throat> lower down here on the left, lack of test wiseness, you know. Especially when people lack confidence in their uh, study um, and in their exam taking capacities. Um, often people are, you know, they're just not confident. You'll see that with multiple choice exams sometimes. Some people will say, well, I always kind of end up picking the wrong choice or I'll have a correct answer there and I always seem, if I make a change, I will change it in an unfortunate way for me, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that sense, so how do you learn to do that kind of orientation toward exams and enhance confidence that you can handle what the exam will require of you, you know? So there would be that aspect of it. Um, perhaps on the whole, more central, up in the top right corner, test anxiety, glorious uh, theme of course, uh, different things that are mentioned there. Of course, anxiety impedes concentration. Um, and can cause panics during a test, and uh, blanking out, of course, is classic for many individuals. Again, a lot of time, it's the lack of efficient preparation that contributes to that, but it's also knowing what to do with it in the situation itself. You know, if you're there and you're starting to blank out and struggle, you know, are you faded to that, and, and you know, whatever is going on in your thoughts now about the inevitability of the struggle that you might fail or what have, what have you. Uh, or is there a way you can gain control over the situation even at that point in time and improve your outcome, you know? Um, so again, uh, a consideration of how you're doing in the test and how you manage your anxiety levels becomes important. And then, of course, in the bottom right-hand side, test skills, uh, again, as you see there, by way of some examples, making poor use of the time, uh, writing incomplete computations, you know, things along those lines, you know. Uh, poor use of the time, for example, is often, of course, uh, interconnected with anxiety that's impeding that process for us. Eh? So, uh, Cheryl?
So there are two things here uh, we just touch on today in this very short time that we have to work with. Um, but meaningfulness, fundamental, right? When you're taking solving problems and then you have a chance to try to solve that problem again, you're trying to access how meaningful that information is, how much uh, you understand the concepts, uh, why you would solve the problem that you were solving it, you know, your confidence in, in getting an answer. But a lot of it does come down to making information meaningful. If you're just in the rote memory, now in engineering that's much less likely to happen perhaps than you might find in some other areas, but uh, it is a trap. Uh, it's so easy when you're studying to sit back and say, I'll read this stuff over. Way too passive, you know, you need to be as active as possible. And nowhere is that ever more evident than in, uh, in engineering, of course, right? So there's that emphasis on problem solving and thinking it through and reasoning and being organized, you know, and working through solutions. So trying to make information as meaningful as possible contextually and also, of course, within that building your confidence and the budding engineer that you're in the process of becoming, you know, so that you're gaining your confidence, you can do that kind of thinking, you know, you can figure these sorts of things out. Uh, and you will practice doing that. And, of course, organization. Um, and uh, now this one here is a fairly trite example, really. But uh, this is insofar as a person might be a little bit stuck on remembering the amygdala, um, which uh, is the emotional and emotional center of the brain. When you find you're in an exam getting rather overwhelmed and emotional, probably your amygdala is, uh, is at work there. Um, and uh, you know, if you're struggling with the meaning of something, sometimes you can use a mnemonic technique, like in this case, you know, the emotional center is being this person, Amy, simply because it's a convenient name word there, uh, you know, with, her, with, her, with, the, with the cats back up there, you know, and saying, oh, well, that's emotion, you know, at work. Uh, again, irrespective of the situation, striving to gain meaning, even if it is, relatively speaking, artificial meaning is really important, you know, because that artificial meaning, if you use that enough times, the Amy example there, Eventually, you will just know, oh, it's involved in emotional processing. The amygdala is involved in emotional processing. We will have it. So it will be a short-term uh, bridge to help you, you know, look like you know the answer, essentially, or kind of have a, a more of a superficial understanding of what it's about. But then the use of that sort of thing over time allows a more stable memory representation. And you probably won't even need the use the mnemonic anymore. But far more than that, of course, is any kind of meaning you can put to it, you know. So, for example, if you can see the diagram, you know, in engineering, I'm sure you're talking about forming, drawing diagrams of problems all the time, you know, so you can conceptualize it. Uh, anything you can do to add meaning to it. In this case, uh, connecting it to the limbic system and seeing how it connects to the pituitary gland and how it relates to the adrenal gland and so on. All this sort of stuff helps us to appreciate how, uh, how we experience anxiety, you know, and how the stress is, and the extent to which we've got that more meaningful and in-depth understanding, but that's a better level, higher level of, of, of knowledge of that, you know, um, and that would be good. So again, always that meaningfulness thing. And then organization, single most important concept, it says, you know, when you are often feeling overwhelmed when you're studying, Certainly if you're cramming, you know, too much to do and too little time, this is a humongous difficulty when it comes to uh, learning effectively, okay? Uh, cramming doesn't give you a quality memory. You might even survive the test tomorrow, but you know, you'll be anxious because you're not confident in your memory and, and you're not likely to retain that information for a subsequent exam later on. So again, there's a number of drawbacks to that. The more you can organize, and it also means that there's organization in the material, but the reason that works so well is because our long-term memory deals well with information that's organized, you know? If information goes in fairly haphazardly, like we do when we're cramming in a terrible rush, it, it won't go in in a nice coherent, interconnected way, and pulling back the information over time, being able to access that information later, that becomes compromised, you know? So it's really important 
to consider organizing. And again, one of these tools, so to speak, when you're learning information, is to recognize that in terms of how our short-term memory functioning works, we can only hold on to roughly seven bits of information in any 30 seconds. So you're trying to input information faster than roughly seven units, seven meaningful phrases, meaningful ideas, or concepts that you're trying to interconnect in a formula, even, you know? And you're trying to do that at a rate in your rush, you know, faster than seven or so items in any 30 seconds that you're trying to see the relationships between, then you're going to find that that's going to be a frustrating experience. And it's natural, because that's how short-term memory works, you know? Short-term memory is very, very limited. So, you know, you need to think, how do I study so I can only extract out and work with a limited number of ideas at a time and make those meaningful, organize them. You see this organizing and meaningfulness stuff becomes entwined, right? So really important. So here, there's an example. Mind Maple is a program, uh, an organizational, hierarchical way of kind of parsing out information and so on. There's Mind Manager. There's a number of these out there. And uh, these are fabulous tools to facilitate learning and dealing with limited amounts of information. So there's a couple of examples there. So like one would be this one here, on biomechanics formulas. And these are actually ones that students have generated in the course of study in different courses they've been in. Um, and you see here, the, the, there are six main, or seven main things that were identified by this individual. <coughs> and those are indicated uh, in the orange areas there. Um, and again, it's seven. You know, you try to figure out how do I organize my material so I'm never overloaded, right? You try not to go much beyond seven if you can manage it. Seven plus or minus two, two seems to be the rule of thumb on that. And then again, you work through. But organize, organize. It does all sorts of wonderful things for anticipation of exams, like, for example, to compare and contrast things so you don't mix things up, you know, that you might need to make sure you keep those, say, two concepts or two types of problems separated and so on. It's working on semantic knowledge because it's the meaningful breakdown of concepts and ideas. And then, you know, once you get that organized, of course, there's also the need for demonstration of procedural knowledge, which of course are the steps of solving problems or applying formulas and things like that. So you gotta make sure to be doing lots of that because that's what your tests are likely to, to consist of, right? When you study, to a large extent, you want to simulate test taking conditions as much as you possibly can. You gotta be testing your memory all the time and solving problems, getting to the point of doing those from memory insofar as you can, as, as automatically as possible, without thinking. Very effortful is this study stuff, you know? But there's a real payoff in it when you're able to engage in that and make that more of a habit, you know? And then this is just another one on factoring polynomials. But again, it's that organizing. Again, that's on the meaningful breakout level. But again, you'd want to be problem solving, of course, and, and categories and things like that. And uh, this one here just underscores, again, one of these limitations it's important to be appreciative of. And that is that um, over time, if you, for example, are in a lecture, and you leave a lecture and you don't do any studying on it over, over 24 hours, your memory for the lecture, at least this old research here, would suggest you could be down, down to about 33%. I saw another study one time that was down as low as 23%, and they vary in from there upwards of 50%, but nonetheless, between a quarter and half of your information is forgotten because you didn't use it or review it in the 24 hours after you learned it. And that's natural. That's not your memory is worse than anybody else's, you know? So it's really important to recognize this. So you need to have study routines that allow periodic review and retesting of material and, you know, strengthening your memory trace for different kinds of problems and things that you're learning and doing. And, and uh, as well, you know, when it comes to time management, you have to look at schedules. You see this uh, question at the bottom. Why don't you use them, you know? Uh, it's really useful to always be planful and find a way to organize things. And ways to make information manageable is, this is an acronym, of course, for that. 
make information as make tasks as specific as possible, right? When you sit down and go study and suddenly you don't want to study, you know, or you want to get up and leave or whatever, you know, often it's because the task in your mind on some level is too big or too onerous, too difficult, you know? So it's really a useful thing to realize, hey, I've got to, maybe I can do a smaller piece of that. And then, you know, I need to make some progress here. So let's break it down. Make it measurable so you can see the results, how far you've gotten with it. Um, action oriented. Anything you're doing by way of planful activity, make sure it's something you're doing all the time, right? Even if you're uh, you know, getting an outline, like a hierarchy of ideas, or solving a problem, you should always be engaged physically. Keeps you more mentally alert too, of course, and you're, again, more active, like you're going to end up being when you write exams, for example. So you don't want to be passive. Uh, again, make sure it's realistic what you're setting forth to do at any given time that you're studying. And timely, you know, if all the things that you have to do, not one thing, if done right now, would have the greatest payoff, right? You know, make sure you're always cognizant of that. And this here then just shows you that in terms of procrastinative tendency, you know, you start working on the task. If you don't break it down and find a piece that you can work on, you will get this reaction here, I don't want to. You know, hey, I don't want to. And then that sets the stage for going down, as you see on the bottom part here, where avoidance kicks in, and you stay away from the test. Now remember, that becomes a habit. The more you do that, the more likely you are to get in situations similarly, get flustered or frustrated by it, and then say, I don't want to do that. And then rationalizing kicks in, hey? Hey, you know, I can do this tomorrow. I've got tomorrow afternoon. This is marvelous. That's what I will do. I don't have to do that today. Ah, but now that starts to become habitual within you, right? So it gets easier and easier to say that. So no, you don't want to fall into that trap. So again, you know, basically, uh, you got to say, uh, keep working at it. Do a little bit more. Do one more thing, even if it's just a little bit more. Often that'll be enough to give, give you enough momentum to keep going. Um, and again, this just makes a comment about stress management and working uh, smarter. A lot of it's about the perceived stress, of course, that we have to deal with. And of course, it's anticipatory. Um, and here, you know, stress, of course, is not all bad, right? And um, as you can see here, if you have no stress at all, it's equated off with your boredom in this diagram, but often you're not as mentally alert. If you're too relaxed and not feeling any tension at all, often that, uh, that suggests your performance might not be all that good, you won't be as alert, you won't be you know, getting your second win to try to write the best answer possible. And again, try to get the peak performance is a, me a, you know, a medium amount of anxiety, mid-range, moderate amount. And again, it's like trying to get those butterflies flying in formation, as they say, you know, make the, make the thing go. But if you get too anxious, and you're over here where you're starting to get exhausted and blanking out and stuff like that, do a little quick relaxation thing during a test, you know? <sighs> Diaphragmatic breathing really quickly for 10 seconds can do wonders to reset that and bring you back to the mid-range. Um, and then test anxiety has reason and non-reason fear. I'll just really quickly touch on these things. Um, reason anxiety, let's not forget, is reason anxiety because you really don't know you know the material. So you're anxious and people would agree, yes, sir, you've got a good reason to be anxious, you really don't know the material. So the key thing is, is your preparation there, right? And non-reason is when a person is extremely, is actually ready to write the exam, but you know, because of, you know, things from their past and so on, they're anxious anyway because they still irrationally fear that, you know, they're gonna fail anyway. These people will end up throwing up in the, in the uh, washroom before the test and still coming out with 85 or 90 or something, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, we can just leave through these So again, reason and non-reason. Things to do, use schedules and smart goals that we just talked about. Uh, you know, plan rewards. Again, the best rewards, though, are intrinsic, you know, satisfaction that you know how to do that now, right? And, you know, and that you're making progress on your goals and, you know, and you're feeling on top of your work, I mean, all these things. But you should have other kinds of rewards as well, things to look forward to that make counterpoint to that, right? 
Um, and that 40 minute study verse is like you basically sit down, whatever the time frame there, it doesn't have to be 40 minutes, and you sit there and you decide, okay, this is a burst of energy. You're going to be very physically active, taking notes and solving problems, and it's only 40 minutes. I'll take a little break and then I'll do another 40, you know? But this idea of 40 as opposed to three hours, you know, without a break, I'm exhausted, you know, just thinking about it. And then you might not persevere at all. And, uh, yeah, and then final words on this again, to be an active learner cannot be emphasized enough, okay? So active learning means you're thinking all the time, and you're trying to form relations, trying to see patterns, trying to make meaning, trying to see outlines on material, and again, being physically active in so doing. Overlearning means once you get to the point where you can recall something or do a problem, say, for the first time successfully, you're not there. You say, hey, I can do that, I'm there. But overlearning is repeated doing that over time, so it becomes so automatic within you. So you gotta literally plan little overlearning opportunities where you periodically go over the material or try out, say, the steps to a problem and, and practice problems periodically, especially the ones that are more challenging to you, okay? And uh, be aware of factors influencing time, lack of skills, um, again, so work, work on that front. Uh, or if you're feeling overwhelmed, or if you're procrastinating, you know, try to do an honest assessment. Often, often at the end of the day, you can evaluate your day and ask, what happened to my time, you know? Was I procrastinating? What was going on here? Uh, so again, it's, it's useful to do that and try to get a gauge on what really was happening. So uh, the question is, um, to, if I could elaborate on some test-taking skills. Yeah. So test-taking skills, I mean, it, it really depends on the nature of the test that you have to do, you know. Um, and um, so, for example, if it's a, like you know multiple choice, then you'd want to be studying and in anticipation of that, doing lots of comparisons, you know, and trying to recognize, the, you know, how are our tests like that designed, and how can I start to prepare for that, you know? Uh, again, problem solving, you'd want to be practicing problem solving, and then you want to get into a distributed effort in that regard, which is that over, overload, over learning thing that was referred to there. You know, so you identify the problems that are continuing to challenge you, that you're at risk of forgetting, and then you, you know, take another example like that one and try it, you know, in a matter. Ideally, you try a problem like within hours of the first time you, you tried it out, you know, you try it again, just to reinforce and strengthen the memory traits, right? And to make that as automatic as possible. But another aspect uh, has to do with the anxiety. And a really critical thing is your, um, your expectation. When you are studying, it's great to have an expectation, obviously, that you want to pass and get your 60 or your 65, uh, you know, you might have the expectation or hope that you'll get a 75 or an A in the course, you know. It's good to have an expectation because that keeps you trying when you're studying, right? Like, do I really know how to solve that problem? That problem could show up on an exam. I really had better practice that one because there's a very good chance that seems to be a core kind of problem. I better have better know that sort of problem, you know. So that kind of being attuned to and alert to the kinds of questions and problems you anticipate, and a realistic assessment about, about where you are. But expectations, you have to be very wary. If you go into the exam on that morning, okay, you've, had this, you've had these expectations, you've been trying hard to, to meet them from the standpoint of can I do these things, you know, can I solve these problems, etc. But if you carry that into the test, so the morning of the test, you're sitting down, you're, you know, you're sitting into your exam place there, the exam is being passed out, but you still are holding the expectation. It comes in the form of, I gotta, or I have to, or I must. I must get 60 or I'll be kicked out of my engineering class this year. You know, that kind of thought, fear thought, right? Now, when you turn over the test, because you're full of negative anticipation, and if you see a problem, a question, and you, and you don't know the answer, it doesn't seem to you that you know the answer, 
then you tend to panic and engage in mental subtraction, you know? Like that one for 15%, oh my gosh, the best I can do now is 85. I only started like five minutes ago and I've already lost, shake off 15%. This is not good. And next thing you know, I'm doing another one, another problem that I'm in trouble, I feel. And oh my goodness, another 15%. Well, the best I can do is 70 now. And as you have that expectation and you look at your apparent test performance and you see the discrepancy between the two, you tend to panic and blank out. You know, you start to think about the time more. Really, these are called task irrelevancies, you know, because you're not really thinking about the task anymore. You're thinking about, I'm going to fail, or all of this interfering stuff like running out of time and things like that, you know. So basically, you don't want to go in with an expectation as much as that makes sense, it seems to you, you know. You've got to really try to turn off your expectations, and you go into a test with a expect anything on the test that makes you more resilient. That allows you to handle surprise questions, you know, that you didn't anticipate. Um, have this, uh, refuse to start mentally subtracting marks, you know, to do that only increases your anxiety. And fight for every mark, you know, which really is demonstrate your knowledge everywhere you can and use the full time and you're going to keep trying no matter what, to demonstrate your knowledge, see what you can try. If you don't know something in one question, you'll come back and try that a little later on. You go on and do the other ones that you know you're confident you can do well right now. That kind of thing, you know? So that's the sort of stuff I guess I'm getting at. But be very aware of expectations going into a test, you know? You got, you're in a kind of like, it's like a job, like really. You're in there now trying to earn marks everywhere you can, you know? And you're not going to give up and just keep trying. Of course, you're in a better position if you feel you've studied well and you can keep reminding yourself, hey, I've been to the classes and I studied well, I really know this stuff. 